right, we have tried basically every single hobby tool and gadget, and these are by far the worst. You've got a mini fridge under your painting desk. Have you got what? <laughs> this is not a hack. This is not so, a hack. I guarantee no one thought that's where that was going. Absolutely total was a brush. I was like, clearly it's me. Like, because everyone's using this stuff. You treat your wet palette as if it's a bonsai tree. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> I've prepared something to demonstrate. I don't know how this is going to go. It's going to be like water all over the desk. And this will work and function for hours and hours and hours without fail. I've tried every wet palette, like all of them. And every single one has the same problem with... James, you taught a class then? Did yeah, uh, the first of uh, first class of a new curriculum which uh, we have launched this year, which is an army painting class. So learning how to be efficient with time, efficient with paint application for both infantry and also vehicles. Um, so yeah, first one was at Element this weekend with nice. with some, I think thirteen students, which is quite good. So. Is that difficult doing one for like the first time? Because you've done the EMC for eight long? years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, um, uh, it, it is. I think one of the things to first is like it's just the timings and stuff, and just making sure you know. You deliver the curriculum as best as physically possible, but at the same time, making sure that you're learning where, how you can make the courses efficient, but without sacrificing value, if that makes sense. Mm. So it's like, yeah, it's a, it's a bit, bit of a juggle. Um, but no, it's always it's always fun doing a new curriculum. We've got, uh, I've got a few others planned uh, for the future, which will be good. But um, but uh, yeah, the Army Painting one was really good. It had some fantastic results, honestly. Like um, seeing people kind of like, learn the process and learn kind of like how to be way more efficient with time and get more more reward for that in a sense of what they actually achieve over the over the weekend which was good um but the goal is not to complete the tank on day one and complete all the infantry on day two but it's just to get as much done as physically possible following the method of painting the process and all the efficiency things that we teach um just really so that they can go away with a lot more confidence to to uh, get through their their gray shame so to speak in a more efficient way um, without sacrificing the thing that they want, which is a, a good looking army or project, you know? So, so yeah, it was good. Nice. Sweet. Should we do some uh, listeners' comments? Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Uh, Aaron Cheek says, I know some people say, if you can't see it, then it doesn't need painting. So painting in sub-assembly is not necessary, but I can't have things unpainted. So sub-assembly is, is essential for me. I'm still a noob, so to speak, but I'm also really OCD about things. I have a bone to pick with this. You you can see it. People always say like, oh, if you can't see it, it doesn't matter. But you can. What, 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 what are you talking about? There's like, some things that you can't. But like most of the stuff when people like apply that, like, oh, you can't see it. Like say like a Marine and there was like, say like behind the chest, you can't see the equivalent stuff. But you can. You can see it. There's certain bits that you can't. If it, if it, for me, if it's like the inside of a tank and you seal the tank up, then unless you've got x-ray vision. Fair play, you know, but no but one's like, sub-assembling like, a tank, are yeah. they? For the sake of painting the interior so I can glue no, it together. I get, I get that. No, yeah. I get, yeah, I get what you mean. Yeah. From from the point of like infantry, yeah, I guess. There are, there's certain, there's normally, there's certain angles where you can see the thing that people are saying, oh, you can't see. Yeah, I agree. Mm. But I generally think, unless you're again painting to like a, competition level or something like that i think as long as those things are maybe like base coated or if you've used like a if you've used like a black spray and your main armor color isn't like too far away from that then you can get away with it, it just looks like shadow doesn't it i feel like i use sub assemblies more for stuff that's hard to reach rather than stuff that's not visible yeah i, get yeah, what I, mean. I agree yeah like most of the benefit of sub assemblies for me comes from the fact of you can clearly see it, and it's going to be a massive headache to reach it. So that's why I, that's why I'll often leave my, well, pretty much anything I paint off the base because the base kind of hinders you from accessing from the bottom. Mm. I know James is very anti <laughs> sticking a model to a base after the fact, but we all have different processes. That's I don't know where I land on that. If I'm honest. Yeah. I've, I've tried, tried both. both. I've, tried I've tried both, and I don't know what one I prefer or why or yeah. there's normally something else that I hate on the model that I've done that I'm not focusing on that <laughs> it does kind of depend I don't it does depend on the models as well because some models are very like skinny and spin and depend on the pose like sometimes it is really it is, easy it, to reach on, everything on, honestly it's purely down to pose like yeah. the whole base thing it's down to pose like for example some of the some of the models that have got big capes and things on them, it's literally impossible to access it because of the base being in the way, like the underside of the cloak. So I agree with you on, on you know on models like that. But I think for there's a lot of models out there that can be painted fully with the base mounted because you can you can physically access everything. Um I'm a big fan of an open pose anyway, so I don't really like stuff covering covering chests. I know intercessors and things like that, you can't have them all of them in single handed OG in the bolt gun, but like um but uh 
go as much open pose as possible. And then, yeah, where where obviously the bolt gun covers the chest or the gun covers the chest or whatever, just do that sub assembly. Yeah. So, yeah. Little early tip that kind of leads into the army painting, speed painting thing is like people don't think about building your models in a certain way to speed up the process if you get what I mean. Well, everything's the, the, everything's in the plan. Like if you plan, you know, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. So oh, early, so early on, he's dropping them. Little yeah. sound bite. Is that on the course, is it? It's yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, James Curtis says, the three water pots just blew my mind. My paint pot is an old Easter egg teacup with about 15 years of paint crud on the sides. Uh, I also find photographing minis a good way to spot things you're not happy with. This made me really like laugh because I forgot those like Easter egg mugs are like iconic. Yeah, I feel like that's a real like <laughs> mid 2000s like yeah. fad. Can, and can we just can we just not overlook the fact that he used a word which I haven't heard in about two decades, which is crud. Like right. I, I haven't heard that word. I I actually hear that word. Well, not so much anymore. But I have a friend who I haven't seen in a little while, and he um, it's one of the only people I've ever met who like doesn't swear. Okay, like just flat out does not swear. And he would, but he would always say crud instead of <laughs> instead of uh, instead of something. So I, I get really like the se- I'm I'm super. I'm, I'm, I feel like I make myself sound like an absolute lunatic unnecessarily on this podcast, but. When as soon as my water cup starts to get like all paint and stuff around the top, I'm like, that's gone. I just feel I feel like it makes my brushes. I'm like, I can't clean it in there because it's not clean. Jam, I, I jam, kind of jam dry the jam jar in the dishwasher gets it done every time. Yeah, I just have like like a jam jar type thing, and I wash that's what it I've got out, as well. Wash it out every every time. Pretty much. I, I, but eventually, I, eventually, after like literally years, it will like build up like scum around the top. You know, not if you use your electric toothbrush and a bit of bio strip. Oh, mate. Yeah. And not if you the bio strip in my like my free jam. I've got the, I've got another jam jar. <laughs> depends. It depends if you like your jam jar. Yeah. Or just do I do hardly paint, and then it won't happen. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know my favorite? I've got like a real. Do you have a specific like brand of thing you like for the water pots? Uh yeah, yeah. IKEA IKEA candles, the big ones. Yeah. Yeah, they're amazing. Actually. No, like, that, I'm like gone that. Bucket. I'm gone that deep. Mine is uh, specifically the South, the Doritos salsa. It's like the perfect size water cup for me. Yeah. That's yeah. insane. Yeah. That's just such a weirdly like specific. <laughs> I expect. Thing. I expect now in the comments for everybody to be putting what they use as a water pot. That's that's got. Do you happen. keep the lid? No, no, no. The lid's why would gone. Why you keep the lid? Why would you keep the lid? Yeah. Why would you keep the lid? I'm just wondering. If you're buying one with a lid. No, but I will. When when I notice that mine's starting to get like a bit a bit beyond its day. I'll be like, oh, I better buy some more salsa on this week's shop. Treat myself to some tortilla chips and then uh, get a water pot out of it. That's just crazy. I just go to Ikea, buy a new candle. Yeah, yeah but then you got to burn the whole candle. Yeah, you... What, you don't like the nice smell in your house? Yeah, but you're, you're like 18 hours away from like, having a water cup. <laughs> yeah. Not if you plan, if you plan, you go, right, okay, I know I'm going to need one in six months. I'll get one now. And six then, months? Yeah. At least the salsa thing, if he doesn't quite finish it, or we can just wash it out. Yeah, like, you're true. like I mean, sitting there carving the candle out. To be fair, I will finish it. It's not hard. No, no, I'm just saying. (laughs) Uh, Luke Martin says, I'm listening to the podcast in random order. Some memes and debates I get backwards, but you'll always inspire me one way or another. Uh, Been painting a little every night since mid-February, and it's becoming a routine every night. Even if I don't really feel like it, I sit and pull the models up I'm working on uh, because I know I'm so much more organized and know what I have to do next. And I always end up having a great time. I thought this was funny because the idea of watching these in random order really unnerves me. It's like, um, remember them books with like choose your own adventure? Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Turn to page 34 to go in the castle. Yeah, it's like that. Three, it's go like, for the woods. Yeah. You finish episode yeah. 24 and then you're like, right, go to episode six or go to episode 32. Yeah. Whatever one you want. <laughs> I love the idea of us like talking about something that we've talked about and then like, Five episodes later, he'll finally find out the thing that, the thing that we were referencing. Matt, the best part is like potentially us arguing over who said something, and then like and two, then he finds two out episodes after. later, yeah. he's <laughs> like, oh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, we was round about this earlier because the hobby hacks thing at the end of the episodes, mm-hmm. you're doing all of them in April, and there's yeah, an apparently. argument. There's an argument about who came up with that, and neither of us can remember. And everyone's pointing the blame on me, and I don't think it was Mark. I'm it's- certain it was George, even though James has told me that it was James. I'm still certain it was George. I'm quite happy for that deflection to be happening. So it's fine. Unbelievable. Always on this podcast. I'll I'm take like a hit for everything. 99% sure <sighs> that well, it was me. actually. Honestly, <laughs> 99% sure that it was actually George. 
Someone in the comments can let us know, I'm sure. But yeah, well, we will have seen the episode by then, I suppose. But uh, yeah, I'm going to listen back immediately after this. Yeah, but um, but yeah, I'm sure it was you. <laughs> and well, no, you said it was me. You said I just volunteered. Well, it. I know it wasn't me, so it was one of you two. <laughs> no, I'm not being funny. I, I'm I'm okay at maths. There's only three of us, and you didn't say it, and you didn't say it, so it's obviously it was me. <laughs> <laughs> like, but yeah, but the fact is, Joe went like, I, I hear you, James. I accept what you're saying, but I'm still going to blame George. Yeah, but I'm yeah. totally cool with that. That's fine. I reckon. I'm sure I'm, you are. Yeah. <laughs> from, from memory, George egged it on a little bit more. And then, by the way, obviously, you've all heard my first one by now criticised me because I didn't invent it like what on earth obviously I didn't invent it I'm not gonna none of the hobby hacks that you've done you have invented for like, James definitely invented the toothbrush because I know for a fact he's the only person on earth who has ever done no we've that. had plenty of comments I just want to caveat I did not actually invent the toothbrush <laughs> <laughs> that is not my claim yet. yeah like what we have we, have, we got to give credit now to like the person who invented George, George the shot just, glass. George just wants you to be an artiste. That's what it is. Yeah, you know? well, I'm so. not interested. <laughs> I'm not interested. If you're a long-term listener of the podcast, you'll know how important it is to have the right tools to aid you in your painting. And if there's one piece of equipment that I could never live without, it's my Onyx lamp from Native Lighting. It doesn't matter what brush or paints you have if you can't see what you're doing in the first place. The Onyx is the perfect lamp for miniature painting because it's super bright, 2200 lumen LEDs cast soft and diffused light on your models without any harsh shadows. And its daylight balanced color temperature of 6500K gives you the confidence that the colors you are painting are accurate. As someone with a very small hobby desk, by far my favorite feature though is its articulating arm, which clamps to the side of your desk, maximizing your workspace. It's also super adjustable so you can sit comfortably in the perfect painting position without sacrifice. It also folds up into a compact shape, which is great if you like to travel to paint with your friends. To upgrade your setup and order yours now, head to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop or head to the link in this episode's description. Right, we have tried basically every single hobby tool and gadget, and these are by far the worst. So this is going to be in no particular order. Uh, some of the, I guess, product categories, not necessarily like a specific product from a specific brand, but like a product category that we have some better alternatives for, most of them being DIY solutions or, you know, alternative product that we suggest. And uh, we're going to be rattling off through these, going through them in no particular order, I suppose. Uh, but the first one we have on the list is a wet palette. And by wet palette, I don't mean having a wet palette, but the pre-manufactured, branded, specific for miniature painting wet palette. Which we've spoken about on countless older episodes. I it's think, like a, it's an original topic. For yeah. us. it's like first few episodes. Uh, the TK Max Jamesism was born. Yeah, that was it. Well, in true Blue Peter fashion, for any of you that are uh, as as old as me or as vintage as me, um, I've prepared something to demonstrate. So I'm a big big fan. <laughs> I don't, I, by the way, I just want to. I know I've just cut you off, and people keep commenting telling me to stop cutting in, but I. I don't know how this is going to go. I just want to caveat that for everyone. Oh, there's no, it's, go, look, look, I'm just envisioning there's going to be like water all over the desk. Like everything's going to be like the mic's going to cut out. Look, look, for the okay. audio listeners, James has presented a, a Tupperware lid and some other, uh, some other gubs that he's yeah. going to do a live demonstration for a paint, paint perspective exclusive. Yeah. A live, so, live if you are, so if you are listening, you need to watch. So it's so a jump onto YouTube, watch the channel and then subscribe while you're here. <laughs> Um, we're yeah, gonna do, we're going to do a bit of a picture in picture, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. This as well. So, um, so yeah. So, uh, if any of you that, uh, that are listening or watching that are a bit OG and um, and remember the uh, TK Max Tupperware aisle conversation very early on, I have tested and used a whole plethora and swathe of wet palettes over the years, and I always go back to the DIY one which I use um, purely because I think personally it's got some real advantages. Um, and just helps to focus you as a painter, which I'll explain a bit more as we go into it. First things first, the setup, what you will need for this, uh, for this, uh, this walk, walk through of the wet palette. Um, we have got, uh, my favorite, my absolute, I'm a bit of a paper towel snob. I'm happy to admit that. Like, um, I, I, I if anyone knows or has come on a class, then this I'm goes big... back to a very old debate. One of the first episodes was the, yeah, I mean, I will often not be much of a snob when it comes to specifics such as this. However, the Blitz, um, 
blitz paper towel. The OG, the OG blitz is 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 the paper towel to use for all your miniature painting yeah. needs and uh, and for your wet palette. So yeah, so the, I, I've got a, a pre ripped off piece that's folded in half. Um, we then also have um, some baking sheet. Uh, this is just grist with paper baking sheet. Um, you can get it from anywhere really. That they're not. I'd advise you get the 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 sort of the white colored one. Uh, the brown is a little bit thicker, um, and it still still performs pretty well. But the the white one is probably what I would recommend if you're going to pick one. Um, Something that a few people have commented asking whenever we've like spoken about this, yeah, is I don't know, I can't remember what it specifically was. It might be whether it's like old grease proof or whatever. Mm -hmm. Certain people were like commenting about certain types not working as well with the water and absorbing. Yeah, yeah. So there's like also that. like so, the I think the parchment paper gets roped in as like a all in one when it's not. So you've got like parchment paper, you've got baking paper, you've got grease proof paper and you've got wax paper, yeah. all of which can be mismarketed as each other. Yeah. yeah. So, so this yeah. is what I wanted to just clarify. So you are specifically saying ba grease proof paper, grease baking proof sheet. baking paper. But sometimes yeah. that will be called just baking paper. And sometimes that will be called just parchment paper. Your right. mileage may vary on yeah. that. Yeah. I like, I, I'm going to caveat and say, this is the one I've used for ages and ages and ages. I'm talking like at least 10. Where is that one from? I've not seen that one. So yeah. So I, I get this from either Poundland or Aldi. That's that's the two places that I get it from. Um. So yeah. So anyway, to dive into the real meat and potatoes of this um of this uh demonstration. So so I've got uh, a pre-cut piece of baking sheet. As you can see, I've got uh, our, my blitz that I folded in half. Very important you fold it in half so it fits and obviously look, i'm using a tupperware lid um and the reason for that obviously if you use the bowl you have to reach over it's a bit a bit frustrating and it's really good to then put the bowl on as the as the as the lid essentially for when you want to close it up and use it but also the reason why this is good is because it's a large working area okay so you, you've got a massive massive size working area so first things first is we're going to add some water to it now um people always say oh how much water did you put in we put in a decent amount so that the paper is is fully fully saturated with water which we want a little bit extra around the edges isn't too much of a problem now one of the biggest biggest issues that i see with loads of painters and loads of things that happen is that whether you're using a DIY one or whether you're using uh, like a, a manufactured branded one, um, the, the, what the, the, the foam and sponge that's in those ones tends to stay quite flat, which is fine. Um, but then when we come on to putting the baking sheet on top, it, that the, the issue that I'm going to explain now is also quite prevalent and, and does happen quite a lot. So as you can see here, we've got loads of little air bubbles that are underneath the paper towel. That's a huge problem. Um, air is the biggest killer of a wet palette. And, and generally, if you've got if you set your palette up with a DIY one like this, you don't want that air in there. So the other reason why I like a lid that's big, get, a nice, get ourselves a nice brush. Um, and literally all we do is we just tease all the air out of the palette like this. So you can see it coming out the edges here. We're literally just going to get all the air out of that wet palette so that there is none underneath. Now, the reason why Blitz is so good is like the advert, when it's wet, it stays strong. <laughs> so we're not going to be, we're not going to be, we're not going to be tearing it or anything by doing this. And I'm being really gentle here just to make sure I get all the air out of that under sheet, which we want. Okay. So this is for all intents and purposes. This is our foam layer that you'd have if you've got a pre-manufactured one. All right. Okay. So again, all the air bubbles are out, as you can see there, which is nice. Um, then when it comes to the, uh, the, the, the baking sheet, obviously it's got a bit of a curve on it. As you can see, you want the curve upwards. So you don't want the ed the edges curved up. You want the actual, uh, middle to be curved so that when you push it down, it goes perfectly in the center. Now what will happen is the edges will curve as you can see here. So you just run your finger a few times like this. Okay. Just to make sure that, that sticks to the, the, uh, the, uh, the sort of, uh, blitz underneath. And again, this is now catching up with the pre-manufactured ones. A lot of people will just put their, their sheet on top and start painting straight away. And they'll, they'll have crinkles or they'll have air pockets and things like this. You really want to have the, the sheet as flat and as tight as possible to the underneath. So, Again, using the brush, and again, this is why the, the using the Tupperware lid is great because you can run a whole brush, perfect size. It fits within the lid, and you can just get that nice and flat. Now, if you do, um, if you do get water on the surface of the of, of the um, of the paper towel, then uh, really quickly, what you can do is again get a great big bit of blitz, and all you do is literally just mop up any of the excess so that there's no big puddles on there. They can be helpful if you're painting so it's for dilution, which I'll explain about in a minute. But if you want, you can just wipe away any of the excess bits of water on there to get that surface a little bit drier. Um, so it just got the moisture underneath. So the palette is now set up, ready to use. There's no air pockets uh, underneath the paper towel which, uh, or the baking sheet, which is great. What tends to happen on a lot of pre-manufactured ones is that the first things first is that the baking sheet or the sheet that goes on top is cut to the exact same size as the foam. 
one of the big big problems with that is that you might not be able to see it but factually the edge of the paper is level with the foam and there is an edge on that so all the way around 360 degrees around that that sheet air gradually starts to encroach in that gap between the the, the top sheet and your foam and it starts to lift most notably on a lot of manufactured ones that happens in the corners so the beauty with the, the diy one that i use is that because this has got a wet edge 360 degrees around it and because you've pushed it down nice and tight to the surface of the pallet there is no way that air is going to get under there and you've pushed out all the air from underneath the pallet so this is a completely sealed environment so air cannot permeate underneath the sheet can't get in there can't stop lifting and this will work and function for hours and hours and hours without fail consistently because air is not encroaching underneath the uh, the, the the sheet that you're going to work on the other thing where this really starts to sort of pay dividends is for things like transfers, for example. Now, I'm not a big fan of fishing. I don't know about anyone watching this <laughs> podcast, but putting a transfer in a bowl and watching it spin around and then the transfer comes off the sheet is not fun for me personally. This perimeter of paper towel, when you're doing your transfers, you just put them on here. It absorbs the water from the from the blitz and then you can literally can use it straight away. You haven't got to do any fishing. You haven't got to have any fights with water, you know, just trying to get your transfers. You can use this circumference perfectly for, for sort of like set for getting your transfers ready. So again, the other thing is that your attention while you're working is focused fully and completely on this working area rather than the bowl to your left where your transfers are spinning around or whatever. The other thing, which is a huge thing for, for me while I'm working and using this palette is, is that for dilution, if you put your, most people will put their paintbrushes into the water pot to add water to their paint. Okay. Which is a, which is a thing which don't get it wrong. It's fine. But obviously brushes, as we all know, absorb water. So the brush head will absorb water like a mop. If I want to make incremental dilutions, as in like just boost the, boost the dilution slightly left or right, maybe add a tiny bit more paint, or if I want to literally just make it a little bit more watery, you have to be either really careful as you put your paintbrush into your water pot. Okay. But with this, all you do, you just touch and introduce it into the paint so that you can literally do incremental stages of dilution by literally just touching and adding that water in there. And if you haven't mopped off all the little bits of water, you can literally just touch this little puddle here, for example, and just add that into your paint. The virtue that has is that what it does is it's focusing your attention consistently on your palette. You're not look, you're being distracted going over to the water pot. You're not doing this. You're not looking anywhere else, but you're working centrally in this one area. And all your focus and attention is purely on this. The virtues, as I mentioned already, are that it doesn't dry out anywhere near as quick as, water, as air doesn't permeate under the edge. It focuses your attention solely on this working area all the time. Dilution, you can just incrementally add tiny little bits of water into your, into your paint from just touching the edge here, for example. The beauty as well is that you can leave this overnight. I've literally had a palette like this, aside from the rare occurrence in England where we have like a 35 degree summer or something crazy like that. I've literally left this without a lid on overnight and I've come back the next morning and it's still ready for me to work. And I can literally just touch the, touch the paper towel, introduce it into the, uh, the area of paint and it reestablishes itself and works perfectly straight away. If it does dry out as well, do you want to just show how you can top it up yes. really easily? Yeah, so again, really easily. All you do is literally, you'll just introduce a bit of water into the, into the corner and you literally just tilt the palette a little bit, okay? And it will just absorb through the paper towel. Obviously, this is really wet, but if it was if it was dried out a little bit, you just tilt it and it just introduces in there. And the beauty of it again is all you do is if you do see a slight air bubble or something, for example, on the on it will be on the paper towel and not actually under here because it can't the paper the air can't access it. But you just use the brush, just literally just to push any air, extra air that you see just out of out of the of the sheet. Factually, this is going to focus you, your attention in one area while you're working for dilution. It's going to really make your dilution way more refined. It's just going to help you to, to really take full advantage of the benefits of that it provides you with. And then if you do want to, the other thing I also suggest as well is if you do want to, you can use the bowl part of the wet, of the Tupperware, put that on. If you've got a mini fridge under your painting desk, you can put that, you can put <laughs> sorry, that. Sorry, sorry. I'm going to, I've been, if you've got what? Have you got a mini fridge under your painting desk? Is, is, a that, a com is that a no, common thing? No, it's not a common thing. I have a, I mean, it's a good idea. This, but this, this, <laughs> is, this, is, this is an early episode hack. Especially, <laughs> especially. It's it's sorry, right. you could have given. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you Mr. Give this to me. I'm sorry I need to do all the eight. I'm ones. sorry, Mr. Mr. Slate. Um, but the the thing is, is like if you if you do want to um, if you do want to make this endure even longer, I have used a mini fridge previously, or even placed this pallet into the fridge. Okay, I've picked it out two or three days later and it's still perfectly workable like it it, it keeps it, it fresh it, 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 Wild, it, yeah. it works really really well now one of the big concerns for i for, guarantee no one thought that's where that was going 
No one thought we were going to end the wet pallet demonstration with. And by the way, there's a mini fridge. The the, the other thing I will say as well about this is that um, is that uh, I obviously, you know, personally for me, like um, I've seen the foam pallets and things like that. That foam does go mouldy. It does, uh, you know, irrelevant of what you may think or may may have have been told. That foam does go mouldy after after some time. This is obviously once if this does dry out, it's paper you can stick it in the recycling as well, which is which is quite yeah. Good. I mean, obviously, every single time you're setting up a new pallet, you're obviously replacing the kitchen paper. So it's, yeah, you know, yeah, I get that totally, but it's no. I meant in the sense of unlike with the sponge, which is the gonna same last sponge you the whole time. Yeah, you can you can try and clean it, but eventually yeah. it's gonna you know. Yeah, and the, and the thing is, it's really uh, like cost wise as well. This is really really economical, and and personally for me, and this is obviously opinionated. If you don't agree, that's perfectly fine. But I honestly get the best performance out of this palette over every other product I've used over many, many years. We've tried all manner of different branded palettes, manufactured palettes, et cetera. Like if you do worry about mold and if you are putting it in the fridge and all that kind of stuff, you can literally just put a bit of copper coin or copper in the corner here and that works just as well, exactly like that. Um, but the thing is, the, the biggest thing that this combats is is air permeating under the sheet and the, causing lifting, which is, and air is the biggest killer of a palette. But I, I've got to really hammer it home that the prep of a, for a pallet is one of the most important things. I see so many people on classes or when I talk on do online tuition or anything like that, where they literally just put the sheet on top of the foam if they're using a preordained manufactured pallet. And they've, there's loads of crinkles, loads of little wear pockets and stuff under it. Like taking two minutes to get that out from underneath the sheet makes your pallet last longer factually. That's not my opinion. Air kills a pallet it's as simple as that i would say as well yeah even a lot of the tips from this even if you do have one of those pallets you can probably take some of the tips from this with regards to yeah 100 like you're saying and, and 100%. get a bit better use out of it as yeah well, well I, i've i've had students that have bought this baking sheet and they've cut it a little bit smaller than their foam and then they do that that's what i do yeah it, it works really well as well but the one thing i would say to you is that like with for endurance i can honestly say to you that I'd have to set up like a camera with a stopwatch or something and leave it overnight with a light on or something. But it definitely lasts longer. This this factually lasts. Put a little GoPro in the mini fridge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like the then, start to the video. Like you know when people put the you know they set it up and they put up the camera in the fridge. Yeah. And, and open then the it, you open the, open the fridge door and there's just like an egg. And like, oh, it wouldn't be an egg for James. But like, but there's just like some tofu and then <laughs> wet palette. Yeah. But what, what I'll say to you is that this this has got loads of user friendly advantages over any other competitive product on the market you can make this yourself it lasts longer performs better and and also gives that, you that functionality whereas whether it's for transfers around the perimeter whether it's like really refined tiny little dilutions as you're just adding incremental tiny little bits of paint like your brush touching that paper towel just slightly absorbs less less water that allows you there to introduce that into the paint it just makes your whole painting process more refined by the way that you work um and yeah as i said give it a try if you like it then then you know i hope you enjoy using it and it and it benefits your painting massively. As artists, we know how time consuming painting miniatures is, especially if you want to achieve a high standard for tabletop or display. Life is busy and we don't all have eight hours a day to paint. Plus, if you're still early in your painting journey, it may feel that you're a long way off ever owning your own beautiful army for your games. For 10 years, Siege Studios has been delivering bespoke miniature painting commissions to collectors and gamers all over the world. We have a world-class team of artists from Golden Demon winners to ex-studio painters, collating hundreds of years of collective experience. Here at Siege, we offer a series of painting levels and services to meet your needs and budget, whether you want a favorite character for your display or a stunning gaming army. We pride ourselves on offering well above the industry standard of quality and our customer experience. To see our gallery, learn more about our services and get a quote now, head over to siegestudios.co.uk or head to the link in this episode's description. Do you, do you use one of these as well? Yeah, so there's a couple of things I was going to say actually, because there's like certain things that I don't necessarily do. Because I I use a manufactured one, but then I do all of the extra steps on top from of this. I remember I seem to remember you saying you just wanted the nice box. You yeah, just wanted the nice yeah, yeah. case. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, the main difference for mine, and um, which I'm wondering if it will help a little bit more. I mean, I don't really have any problems with mine, but the lid that I use, it's the same size, but it's like. Got a bevel in it. It's got flat. like a bevel in it, yeah, so it's yeah. not completely flat. Yeah, you. Yeah, I should have caveated that. You do want to get a lid that you use for your palette that is as flat as possible. So I kind of do what you're saying, yeah, but within the bevel. Mm -hmm. So it's all just like a step smaller. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So I've got a big 
lid, but I don't have a big pallet really. Could you not I've got put, like a mini pallet inside my big Tupperware lid? Could you not put a bit of extra kitchen paper in there to like fill Level the bevel? Level it out. I, you probably could if it was like a little bevel, but this is similarly a design feature that they were quite happy with. <laughs> and it's fairly deep. Um, I, I did actually miss something off that I just wanted to throw in as well, because I, I, I do want to say this. Um, obviously, we always talk about... Um, wet palettes and dry palettes and like what's better, what's worse, whatever, blah, blah. I don't think that there's a better or worse. They're both tools for different jobs, if that makes sense. And you and I, I, I've got quite a lot of water in here, as you can see, but when I don't put loads of water and I just make sure the paper towel is wet, I actually use the, ex, the exterior perimeter of plastic. I use that as a dry palette as well. So yes. you've got everything in front of you. Again, focusing your attention and making you, anything you need to use is there. Like if you are doing dry brushing, you can just take the excess off on, on that dry bit there on the brush and you can dry brush the base or whatever it is you're dry brushing. It has so much functionality and flexibility to it compared to any other, any other palette that's on the market. Yeah, I actually have similar point to that. Um, the good thing about the, the top of that I have is we were saying about obviously kind of flipping it upside down, aren't you? And then the, the actual Tupperware is the lid, yeah, if yeah. you like. The bottom of mine has like a um, like a crisscross pattern on it. So it's like loads of little like squares. Mm -hmm. Do you get what I mean? Like a waffle pattern. Sure. And you can, for using that as a dry palette, that's it's like good, loads yeah. of little mini texture, texture little, yeah. little palettes. That's quite good, actually. Yeah, yeah that's um, really good. Which is quite good because it like just contains, you can put a few different colors at once and it can t contains them in. Yeah. So I've kind of used that. But I actually mostly have a, uh, just like a, a tile, like mm. a white tile. Yeah, tile is good as well. I just have that that I use yeah. for a um, thing. That could be a hobby. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I've tried every wet palette, like all of them. And every single one has the same problem with the paper that comes with it is no good. So I end up just using like my own baking paper mm -hmm. that I then cut smaller to like fit within the sponge. So it basically does the same thing in yeah. effect as that. But then the sponge just dries out like yeah. way quicker. Yeah. So, and, and I've got to say, look, I'm not, we're not, I'd love to be sponsored or endorsed by, by Blitz. Uh, so if you're watching, please do get in touch. But, <laughs> That's the dream. But, but the thing is, That's is, the dream the thing sponsor. Is, the thing is, <laughs> is Regina. It, it is, yeah. Um, the, the paper is designed to absorb and hold water. Like, really really and it does that which is also why we when we use a, a sheet of blitz we fold it in half so we're doubling the absorption that it actually has um you know which is again really helpful but yeah as i said if you, if you like what you see if you see the benefits and the usps of it then give it a try head down to tk max buy a palette buy a tupperware um and um and then you can um you i mean can, <laughs> you can you can set your own up and, and give it give it a trial the tk max thing is maybe that i mean how expensive is it more expensive so in I'll, I'll tell you this right now. The, my, I imagine Tupperware and Tupperware, 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 my Tupperware cost me seven pounds. Okay, and, it's it's that, and it's massive. That's not that bad. Yeah, that's all right. That's not that bad. So you're, it's you're still more expensive than if you were going to You're looking, like you're looking cheaper. total But still significantly less expensive than buying one of the wet palettes from... True. Do you know what? Is, yeah. I wouldn't even know how much they are. They're like 30, 40 quid, some of them. Oh, okay. yeah. So okay, like yeah, you, well. for, that, for that investment of revenue, you could literally buy one or two Tupperwares yeah, and also a pack of blitz, and also your baking sheet, and you still have cash left over for buying a couple of paints. Yeah. So, if you want to do the mini fridge thing, that's probably a bit yeah, more. Yeah, the mini of an fridge investment. blows it out of the water. Definitely. Yeah, it's a bit yeah. more of an investment. The mini yeah, there is, it, there is no one who saw that coming. That's so out of left field, the fridge thing. It works, though. It works. Do you know what? As we were sitting here doing it, I was like, maybe it's just from my point of view, because I've heard you talk about it so much. I'm like, does everyone know this already? Like, are we really doing a whole. Like, are people going to be listening to this thinking, oh, you know, I've already heard that. I've already heard that. And then you said mini fridge. And I was like, no, they haven't heard it. They haven't heard it. <laughs> I they think, definitely haven't heard it. I think the DIY wet palette gets a stigma as I like, try this to see if you like it, to see if you want to buy the real thing. Yeah, exactly. But then you end up coming full circle. I mean, that's what I did. Yeah. I had like the DIY wet palette, made my own one. I was like, oh yeah, this is good. I'll buy a real one. Bought the real one, didn't like it. Bought a different one because I like, oh, this one would be better. Didn't like that one. Got another one, and I'm like, hundred quid deep. On I was going to say, you must be so you you've spent a fair, but you could have got a mini fridge, yeah. Probably right now. <laughs> <laughs> but then you end up, I end up coming full circle to the like. I guess this is like a bougie DIY one, right? This is yeah. like is it, I've never I never thought the word bougie would ever be used in my wet palette. But, yeah, but, but yeah, yeah, no, fair enough. I mean, if that's what you think, I mean, I, I suppose it is. A bit no, smart. no, no. Your your one isn't the bougie one. His one is the bougie one because he's got the fancy case. That oh yeah, costs him forty quid for a wet palette. Forty, 40, quid, for a, 40 wet, quid for a tupperware. Yeah, yeah. 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 throw all the so, wet palette stuff yeah. out. Yeah. I would argue <laughs> yours is quite bougie as well. Actually, it's pretty bougie. It, you know, I mean, it's Blitz. It's TK Max. Like Blitz is pretty premium. So like, yeah, I would actually say that for this specific setup, the kitchen paper quality is more important than the actual 
uh, paper, the oh, definitely. parchment paper. I've got to say this, like the, 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 the sheet that I use, um, I, the paint just behaves in a way which it just doesn't on the, the, the pre-manufactured uh, palettes that are out there. Um, it just behaves like it tends to dr- on the on the pre-manufactured ones. It tends to dry in a patch. They dry, I don't know why yeah. they dry. It so dries quick. like in this weird patch, and then you almost have to reactivate it. With, whereas on the baking sheet, it it because it's got that it's pro- that grease proof because it's got layer yeah, on it because it's got that property of that paper. The the the, the liquid just stays in little puddles. It's and not quite the same as wax paper though because it's no, not like it's water not. repellent. It's not like when the water like beads no. up and runs off. No, like it does not. soak in. No, but uh, do you know not. what's really important to me that everyone always skips over? You kind of mentioned it as you were setting up is. I don't know why there's this notion that like the top of the palette is meant to be like bone dry because part of the process I think for making it easier to squeeze all the water out is to get the top and the paper, the pa- the like palette paper, the parchment paper, fully fully saturated and soaked in water. Yeah, and like I run around it with like my finger instead of a brush, but I'll completely soak the top. Then I'll do what you said and dry it. But what yeah. I like to do, this is a little hobby hack. You ready for this one? I have a little tiny little misting bottle that's used for like house plants. Yeah, yeah. And I'll from above just spray like a light mist on the top. It depends because that like, is ridiculous. It depends because a ridiculous amount of care for your. I don't see. <laughs> I, I take I take the excess water off because if I've I've had it before where I've I've it's a let, mist though. It's not. Yeah, water, no, it's I, a mist. I get that. I get it. But what, what I was going to say is I, I've had it before. I put paint onto my palette and there's been a puddle and I've, the puddle was just gone into the paint. So and into the yeah. Paint. See, so, that's why you so buy I, the mist bottle because it's just it's microscopic. You almost can't even see it. Yeah, I don't. I, I again, whether you choose to do that or not, it's up to you. But like again, same with the mini fridge. But like um, but but all I would say is that yeah, like I, I'm sorry, he comes out of a mini fridge like it's the most normal thing in the world, and I mentioned a misting bottle, and you two are like, oh, well, that's it weird. is no, it is. I don't know. James t- saying a mini fridge to me is less surprising than you coming out that you treat your wet palette as if it's a bonsai tree or <laughs> yeah no i think uh, ultimately one of the real things that i would very much the reason why i wanted to do this in the episode and talk about this was actually like the thing very first first and foremost whether you like the things that you've seen that i've demonstrated in this or not um just making sure that you spend that minute or two to set your palette up correctly um i see it so much even from like really experienced you know painters that have done all manner of different things leaving crinkles creases air pockets and things under your sheet uh, are just it's just a big no-no like you're you're literally tying your shoes together if you're trying to run a race by doing that it's it's the worst thing air is the biggest killer of a wet palette and the more you can do to mitigate it being underneath and that's why on mine that 360 wet perimeter around the sheet that's literally stop it creates a barrier that stops air from getting underneath that sheet that's one of the biggest USPs about it. And it's actually one of the biggest design flaws that a lot of the branded manufactured ones have, like the, the, the paper being the same size perfectly as the, as the foam just completely mitigates the point of, of the function of the palette, if that makes sense. So, so yeah. So if you like it, give it a try uh, and let us know in the comments your thoughts. Cool. Okay. Number two, model holders. I think this is something that we're all, uh, all a bit opinionated about. This is going to be, I guess, our disagreement and disliking for the way that most companies approach the painting holder for attaching your models to, I guess, and holding while you paint. James, yeah. again, going back to an OG one on the on the episode, you dropped the knowledge bomb of the uh, disposable shot glasses. Yeah, hundred percent. They are absolutely perfect for miniature painting, um, and specifically the bigger bigger shot glasses, not the smaller ones that you would typically get down a bar if you were going out with your mates drinking. It's the bigger ones, so the the, the party size ones, the doubles. Yeah, the doubles. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're the, the, obviously they're designed to be held in the hand first and foremost that's what they're for um but what you obviously do with painting miniatures with them is you flip them upside down which makes a perfect cone shape which just fits really really perfectly in the hand they've, and they're, the beauty of it for me personally is that they're light uh which uh, I, i've tried a lot of painting handles and it's like going to the gym while painting models like i literally some of them get yeah, really fancy as well yeah, don't they like, like all the extra all the, gloves all on these, them they're made of like exotic materials yeah i've seen yeah. you've seen those ones with the with the like the arm thing where you can rest your finger on as like a leaning or bracing yeah. point just stick a bit of sprue onto the onto the shot glass just might have bond a bit of sprue on there job done you know like if that's great will, for practicing your edge highlight as well oh uh, yeah, yeah. It's functional tool um, but yeah, I, I really prefer um, shot glasses and I've tried all manner of different holders. Like, you know, whether you like, um, you know, any of the branded ones or whatever, blah, blah. But um, I have both, you know, because I do, I do like some of the like older school uh, painting handles, but the drawback to them being you're kind of only getting one for X amount of budget. Whereas if you go out and buy like a 20 pack of shot glasses, if you're doing an army, you can have every single model on a holder that doesn't need to like come off, I guess, until the end. 
which is like really, really helpful if you're doing a big project because you don't want to be like constantly swapping the model in and out the whole. I've broken models doing that as well. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, is like with a pack of shot glasses, like again, I, 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 I frequent pound down quite a lot for, for, for painting supplies, but, but, um, but like you can buy a pack of 12 for 99 P so it's less than a pound. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they're, and they're great. Um, I know you had experiences of breaking them in the past, but, but yeah, to be fair, not the ones that you were talking about. They're much I, better. I bought some off of Amazon or something and they were just like quite small, like really weak. Yeah, it was just like every time I was holding the model, it was just cracking, and I was like, "This is rubbish." Which is then when I switched to the Jenga pieces for a little bit. Um, but all you do, before. all you do, if you're if, if you're a little bit heavy-handed, you should just put one inside the other. Yeah, you can stack them. instant instant fix. Oh, I don't know. Then you're like halving your value for money. Yeah, but Completely you're breaking less, it. so you need to replace less. Well, I just bought better ones. I just bought yeah. good ones. To be fair, to be fair, the ones they were the same. Not- same kind of price and, yeah. and they, they were just better I think obviously most people probably don't need to look into the quality of their plastic shot glasses because <laughs> like, <laughs> crushing them with a big man hands. Yeah. Um, the other thing I've got to say is that like, I'm talking about like when, if people are just getting them to drink and stuff and they're yeah, like yeah. plastic disposable ones whatever then yeah. everyone, no one cares today. They? they're not really looking yeah. I had some like left over from a party and I was like oh I bet these James was recommending it I was like I'll give these a go they've been, I've been using them since Yeah, they last quite a while I was about to say that I've never once bought like Disposable shot glasses for a part. Not like, oh, I've got a party coming up. Better get the shot glasses. <laughs> right. um, yes, but I'm I'm now like fully on them. Yeah. I, I think one of the things for me that that just really serves a good purpose for them is that they they're really comfortable. They're really light. They're perfect for the design. They're designed for the hand. You know, whether you hold them upside down or, or the way they're supposed to be held for drinking. Um, like, I'm going to disagree. I think they're objectively worse to hold in almost every single way. Probably, yeah. what, for drink, like if, uh, if you're for drinking, holding, I don't find yeah, them more comfortable. Oh, so, sorry. Beg your pardon, yeah. Um, upside down, they're perfect shape for the hand to hold, but then obviously drinking them, you've got it because obviously it's a cone, it's thinner at the bottom. Yeah, but George no, no I'm saying, I'm saying I don't find them as comfortable to hold as a proper miniature painting handle, but I like them for the fact of I've got loads of them. Oh, and really? If I'm doing an army of if like the, yeah, 50 well, models. The, the actual miniature painting handles that are made are obviously designed to be held that way, to be yeah. held that way, okay. and they look into what would be more comfortable and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, but yeah. I think that's outweighed by the fact of if I'm doing like 30 Marines, I can have every single one on a holder, yeah, exactly, at any given moment, and I can just pick it up and yeah. Fire away and I've exactly, got swap yeah. holders over exactly. and, over. and that and that's the thing, like the swapping of them can cause breakages. You get like you can slip, the model can slip out of them sometimes. You, you know, it's what, just whatever. faff and time yeah. and yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and and the, the painting side of it, like I literally my models are built, cleaned, basic material put on them, they're stuck to a shot glass. I do I hold use the holder to do all this break can stuff like the but the undercoat, etc. It doesn't matter if paint gets on there. I've not got like a fifteen pound holder that I'm getting. See, that's again. the thing as well, is I you don't want to like, be like spraying with my nice holder because I'll get paint primer on it and then it's going to get gunked up and it's going to stop working yeah like uh, you know and yeah so i I just i just i think i've tried lots of different things uh, and and genuinely for like for optimal kind of like efficiency of working plus also cost and also not really worrying about getting paint on them for me they just they're just perfect um so yeah yeah i quite like as well because you're normally priming with them yeah you get like some primer over it and then you've got like a little almost like test area Yeah. yeah where it's like it's on plastic as well, should've kind of thing. So should have like, saved that for the end, Joe. Well, and going back well, to your... I I'm sure I would have been pulled up for not inventing <laughs> uh, primer or shot glasses <laughs> or paint. Yeah, George. Or, yeah. Well, um, actually, going back to your previous hobby hack, that is great because if you want to paint your little line on there, exactly, market, yeah, you yeah. don't want to do that on your... Well, Actual one, you model. can't do it on your fancy holder because you're going to be swapping the model, so it's not going to apply. Exactly, yeah. Like, I think yeah. I specifically said when I, when I said that hack that you need to be using different... It's In that case, when you're using uh, a holder for each model. Yeah. yeah, I find it handy for like just quickly test in like an airbrush pass over it or something to see how the paint's coming out and yeah it's good cool. next one I have on the list is uh, a bit more in my category I guess would say in terms of photography uh, this one's going to be a light box so mm-hmm. if you're not familiar these are those like white booths that you buy that often come with like the lights and like a little pop up thing for like product photography mm-hmm. and people use them for taking photos of the models because white backgrounds well lit makes sense right but these aren't designed for front shots of products they're designed for top down views of products and when you look at them some of them do have light strips like down the side but they're not optimal angled lights for where the model is and they're like little like led strip lights like they're not actually that bright personally i like just getting some printer paper uh, a3 if you can like the bigger ones if not a4 because most models are more than small enough to fit in that anyway just getting a little curve on it, put it at the back of your desk and taking a photo with like your, your hobby lamp just over the top or firing forwards at the model and taking the photo that way. 
purely because because it's not in that closed off space in like a little booth. It's getting more ambient light from the room. So if you're doing it in the daytime, like in your in a well lit room, you've got the ambient light in addition to your hobby light. You get a much nicer angle of the shot, and you can be much more flexible yep. in like taking photos from the side and whatnot because you've got that paper behind it. And those light boxes tend to be very very expensive. Whereas I can almost guarantee you've got some printer paper already, and you've already got a lamp that you're taking uh, that you're painting with already. Hopefully, a onyx lamp from the store. But yeah, that, that is what you take first. <laughs> yeah. models, by the way. But uh, and you can get the perfect angle, and you've got everything already. And I find that I can take better photos doing that. So I don't personally understand going out and spending a load of money on yeah. another little gizmo that you've got to store somewhere also, pack down. It's also know? like really easy to put that paper in place over whatever you've got going on on your desk exactly. anyway. Because yeah. like I've had it before where, you know, I haven't had much room on my desk or so I wasn't really sure how to fit that in. But it's fairly easy to just like put a bit of blue tack on each part of the back the of curve. the paper, mm -hmm. make the curve and you know, blue tack it to your, your drawers that are on there with your mm -hmm. paint in it or something. Or I've done it before. I've like put like a primer can there and just like yeah, blue yeah. tacked it to the primer can and then blue tacked it Coffee to the Coffee mug, floor. anything will do. Wow. Well, yeah. I've got something to throw in. It's a, it's a mid pod hack. Um, so if you get a can't pocket, keep saying that every time we say something, by the anytime way. Anytime we give you any sort of info yeah. whatsoever, we're like, ah, it's a little, little hack, yeah. little bonus hack. Okay. Well, it is a hack. So anyway, um, get yourself a, a cardboard box that is the same uh, width as the as the paper. If you cut the box diagonally in half from one corner to the other, it gives you a perfect L-shaped bit that you can stick your paper permanently in and it allows you to have the curve. So you have your own little permanent curve set up. That's what I've so got. Build, what James is saying, build a light box. Well, it's not, it's, <laughs> yeah. But it's not a light box because it's not, it's literally no, he's just, build, it's he's just... building a stand for his curved paper. Yeah. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. And it works it perfectly. So yeah, nice. So yeah. And you can you can just you can literally just blue tag it to that and it and it stays perfectly. Mm. Okay. Next up, liquid mask. Ah, yes. This one may or may not be controversial. I, I don't have any experience with this really, to be honest. So I, I don't really know. I, I it just skipped me by. It always seemed like a bad idea to me. So a, a bad idea in my hands. Yeah. I feel like I wouldn't be able to use it properly. There's so a few there's a few masking products. Mm. I'm talking specifically about the latex that you buy and you brush on. A mm. couple of reasons. I didn't know any of these when buying my liquid mask. I was very, very excited because I was doing a lot of airbrushing at the time. I was like, I'd, I'd seen it online. I'm like, oh my God, how do I know about the liquid mask? It's just like, it's going to change my life. Bought the liquid mask, put it on my model, instantly realized it was drying in my brush. That's knackered now. Absolutely totals a brush, like instantly. There is no way to get that latex out of your brush like once it's soaked up in there. So what is, is it? what is the official recommended way of applying it then? Like what are you supposed to do? With a with a crap synthetic brush. Yeah, kill, yeah. kill it. I don't think they actually... What's it just one use Pretty brush? Much. Brush is I'm done. sure someone in the comments is going to give some perfectly reasonable advice about how you go to... You probably put like, you probably wash the brush in something in a chemical I'm sure there's some yeah, chemical but... or whatever, but you know... I was. I just assumed that I would just be able to, you know, use it out the rinse bottle, it out. rinse it out, and it'll be fine. It's not fine. Second of all, it goes on in such a thin film that when it comes to removing it, it just starts to crumble and turns to dust. It's not this like nice peel that you're expecting. So to get it to work properly, you have to cake on layer after layer after layer, knowing this going in, so that you can get like a reasonably substantial peel. But then you'll find it's got incredible grip strength and when it's like wrapped around any like spindly part of a model it doesn't want to come off then you end up breaking your models it's a nightmare i i, I absolutely hate it I, i'm yeah. gonna completely align myself i tried it. it i thought this is absolute absolute nonsense um and then i just just painted the detail that i wanted neat yeah it, i literally probably spent as much well there are well i will say like there are other masking methods that there i do are, like yeah. and enjoy but this was specifically such a disappointment and i tried so hard to I was like, clearly it's me. Like, because everyone's using this stuff. Clearly it's me. And I've tried loads of different ways of doing it. I've watched loads of different videos. I've not really seen anyone kind of address the fact of this is the problem with it too much. If you go, like people have mentioned it, but it seems that people who use it kind of just neglect that fact, if you go what I mean. Yeah, I'm, I'm just not a big fan. I've, I've tried it a few times and I've just, it's been faff every time. Yeah. I'm just like, I'm just going to paint this thing 
it'd be really neat or just literally take that part off. We have model. you what was it you said you like making a little uh, bib out of a uh, oh yeah so, post it so, yeah, so I, I literally did a hole punch in the corner <laughs> to, so if I want to paint post it though, if, if, it? I, if it was, I wanna it was something like that wasn't it there was a that? cling film thing is that what you're thinking yeah and then he said about another one where you get like a bit of paper or something oh. so that's basically when you've got a metal model or you've got a model where the head is attached to oh, the model that, yeah, I, I literally remember. just hole punches and a hole punch in the corner of a bit of A4 paper and make a bib and then airbrush the skin tone or yeah. whatever it is and then take the bib like off the, uh, like the guy in Toy Story and he puts the little bib on Woody's airbrush his face yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Ba um, basically that yeah I do like I do like using blue tack and like other putty products yeah. I've not tried too many of those I know there's some like dedicated to using as like mask I'm not sure what they're mm -hmm. like but uh, yeah the Liquid mask, the latex liquid mask. Not for me. Not for me. I think you can uh, definitely just go about it with using so, some blue tack or some paper or some masking tape. Yeah, I was gonna say, However you can go about not using it. Well, what has been your... When you realised that didn't work, what did you go to? I think I was expecting it to just save me all this time because I was like, oh, I can mask this bit off, spray it with the airbrush, remove it, and then I haven't got to like, repaint anything or touch anything up. But you end up spending so much time faffing around with the liquid mask and getting it all yeah. over the place and ruining your brush and wasting a load of time that it would have been much, much, much quicker to just airbrush it on and then just paint over all of the overspray. Oh, so your alternative since has just been just paint it just normally. Just paint it normally, yeah. yeah, as if you didn't have it. I think that is a, a thing to take into any gadget and things like this really, is that like sometimes you can just do without it. Yeah. Like, well, it's like we someone's, it, someone's invented it to sell it. Like, yeah. they're not always trying to solve a problem. Do you it's know a I mean? problem. It's a solution looking for a problem. Yeah, yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Like, it... it it just is the case sometimes. So it's like, yeah. We frequently hear from you with questions asking how you can paint like our team of world-class and award-winning artists. Teaching is something that all of the team here at Siege are very passionate about. And we want to share with you the methods and techniques that we use to paint every single day, all of the incredible miniatures and armies that you have seen from us. With the Siege Studios Patreon, you'll gain access to a growing catalog of over 300 step-by-step -step tutorials covering a huge variety of color schemes, miniatures, painting styles, and techniques, from beginner-focused foundation tutorials to full character masterclasses. Each lesson comes in a beautifully designed and easy-to-follow PDF format with accompanying artist commentary with new tutorials added every single week. Your subscription also includes access to our private patron channels on Discord so that you can interact directly with our artists asking for questions or feedback. You'll also be supporting the podcast directly, helping us to bring you these episodes every single week. So if you want to take your painting to the next level and make the most of your very valuable hobby time, head over to patreon.com forward slash siege studios. Okay, finally on the list, we have cork for basing material. Mm. Oh, worst basing material ever. Fresh off That's the a back hot take. Of, yeah, fresh off the back of George recommending the cork thing like on a hobby hack not too long ago. I said for a dry brush palette. Oh, I thought it was like... You, I'm pretty that was, sure a, bon that was a bonus use case. That was a bonus. That was a bonus use case. I'm yeah. pretty sure you said you can break it up and use it as yeah, like basic material. Yeah. Well, people do use it as basic material. Yeah. I, yeah. I just think that, look, it, it... I understand why people use it and I just want to caveat and say that. I understand because you can break it. It looks like rock, etc. Just use rocks. Just use stone. Just use, just use slate. Go back just to use, an old hobby hack and get some, uh, <laughs> yeah, some garden use, slate and crush it with a hammer. Yeah, you can use just, slate just, as slate. Just use that. Like it, it crumbles, it breaks, it absorbs paint. So what happens is that you, if you don't cake it on properly, if you don't paint it properly, you've got to cake loads of paint onto it, you know, and it's, it, it breaks and scuffs really easily. If you put varnish over it, it gets more brittle and can crack more. Like it's just an absolute nightmare. I, I like cork for basing as like a core material that I'm going to add my stuff to. It's kind of like, padding filler if you get what I mean so like almost as if um because I don't want to make it like hollow obviously so I've got mm. to stick all my rocks to something yeah yeah to build up if like you're gonna build around it then fair enough every time I've used it I've PVA'd the whole thing and put sand over the top of it yeah so to build a build a like a raised platform or to uh to add a bit of more of a natural shape so I can break it and then and then I put sand over it so it looks like the, the earth is over the top of it but I never just put cork on the base dry brush it a couple of colors and that's it. I like get I just, why people do that. I've done it a lot in the past. It's a very, very beginner friendly way of going about basing and it does it yeah. quite nice for a pretty low amount of effort and it's very, very easy to just tear with your hands. You, you say you low, haven't got to look for a, like a specific rock that fits the right area you want. You've got to Yeah, but you say low effort, hammer. but I'm not being funny, but getting a knife, scouring a base, bit of PVA and just putting sand on the top of it is low effort. Yeah, like, yeah, but this is this is when people want rocks and stuff instead, isn't it? They want, when the they big want to build rock on, platform on for your yeah, character or something. I've I've never really liked the the look of just using cork. Like I don't think, especially I've, when you get like 
you know, you get like the thin layers of it. And sometimes you can see the layers. You can literally either see the layers coming through the yeah. paint or like you can see the, if it's just flat on the top, like it's a sheet and no one, they haven't like, someone hasn't like cut it up and they're just using the flat top. Mm-hmm. And you, uh, to me, I'm just like, I'm looking too at flat. it. I'm like, well, it doesn't look like. Uh, yeah, I, I can't unsee it as cork either. Yeah. Being honest. Yeah. I'm at a point now where like I've seen enough cork bases to just see cork stuck on a base. Yeah. It's also like just so rare, like James was saying, it's so rare that the paint hasn't chipped somewhere. On yeah. yeah. Like, and models don't it. stick to it very, very well either because it's soft. So like it will kind of flex, even if you pin it, like and it the kind pin, of wants to the crumble. Pin moves, you, the model will move slightly or it'll get knocked and the hole that you put through the cork with the pin will just get bigger and then it'll become, the model will become loose. Like I, it happens all the time. It's like, yeah, just if you want to emulate rock, just use rocks. Yeah. And also it weighs the base down. So it makes the model more stable on the table. So yeah. like, yeah. yeah. My, my suggestion would be to get the, uh, the garden slate, like chipping stuff that you use for landscaping, put it in a little Ziploc bag, give it a whack with a hammer. Job done. Yeah. Get some nice bits of slate. Or like you said, go through, go looking for a forest, get some like bark and I think coconut fiber is quite popular for that sort of stuff. You know, I just can't say I've ever yeah. seen that, yeah. to be honest. I, I think just, there's just better, there's better uh, tree based material, as you can yeah, say, yeah. than uh, than cork, I think. But I, I literally just got a bag of slate and stuck it in my next door neighbor's cement mixer without any cement in yeah, it. Yeah, just do that. And that worked. Everyone yeah. just Everyone's got a next door neighbor with a cement mixer. Yeah. 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 Everyone's a, got a next door neighbor with a cement mixer and everyone's got a mini, mini fridge under, under their desk. Yeah. <laughs> it's always just a weirdly specific thing where you like to do that. And it's so like, niche. Not, so niche. <laughs> question of the week time. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week. If you have a question that you would like us to answer on a future episode of the podcast, please leave it in the comments down below on YouTube. This week we have a rebuttal. Grimdark Mark oh, we says... Start, we started a war. Yeah, we started a little bit of a feud. Grimdark Mark says, so it looks like Jim has upped his game. So backhand across the court I go. Uh, question for you, chaps. When do you class a model as done? I'm going back and doing a little extra here and there, and I also get sidetracked with projects with the new shiny stuff, so never really complete a project or army. What tips can you give to a grim, dark noob like me? Joe, I think you're the perfect man to answer this question. Yeah, never. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's the question done. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I I um, I think the... The best way to do it is we've spoken a lot about planning before mm-hmm. and planning a project. I think in doing a plan beforehand, you'll then know what mark you have to hit to finish because it's one of those things with art, isn't it? It's never really done. You can always add to it. You can always change it. You can, if you don't have a set thing of that's when it's going to be finished, mm-hmm. you will just be able to add to it forever. Yeah. I think for me, like, cause I'm, most of my painting historically has been commissions for Siege because they are painted to like a level. Specific benchmark you have to hit. Exactly. It's It's like, well, I've ticked all of the boxes that are required for this painting level. The model is done. Yeah, that's a difficulty. I think when you're not doing it as a commission and you're not doing it to meet a certain standard, you have to create your own boxes. But I think do that before you start and then you'll know when you've when you finish kind of thing. Yeah. I, I, for me personally, I think one of the, the things that I'd always recommend to anybody is uh, a period of time where you don't look at it. So you, you get the model to a certain point, you look at it and go, right, I'm done. Returning to it with fresh eyes, be that a week later. Don't just don't put it in the cupboard, put it in, in your display cabinet, cover it with a, a mug or something so you can't see it as you look in your display cabinet. Or like just anything that stops you from looking at it so that you can approach it with a, with a clear vision of, 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 of seeing it new, if that makes sense. I think it depends on what the, your um, what you're trying to get out of what you're what you're painting your model for. Because yeah. what you're saying there is probably more geared towards if someone was maybe entering a competition or yeah. they're pushing it to a really high level. But for example, you know we had Peachy on not too long ago, and we were talking about getting models finished for gaming and and armies and stuff. And maybe maybe that aim, maybe that benchmark of where it's finished will be more based on how long it's going to take you to paint 20 of them and, and something like that. So it's like, you're not going to want to keep looking back, are you? On, on no, things, no, but that's, that's fair. Yeah. 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 If you enjoy listening to these podcast episodes every single week, I'd like to ask that you could please do us one small, tiny favor in return and hit that subscribe button on YouTube or the follow button on your podcast app. It takes only two seconds and it really, really helps us out and it allows us to bring you these episodes for free every single week. Thank you so much. Back to the episode. Okay, our little closing weekly tradition is hobby hacks. This is where we share a little hobby hack with you. As we've kind of discussed earlier in the episode, 
Joe has got the challenge of doing all of our hobby hacks for April. What have you got for us? Can I just point out, when we set this thing, I don't think any of us realized that, obviously, everyone's aware by now, we're sort of batch recording a couple of episodes. We don't normally do that. We record one a week. We try and get them out as quick as possible. We're batch recording a few um, because George is going to be away. So it is your fault, actually. I'm blaming you. <laughs> um, and then when it came to the end of like the last episode or something, we all sort of realized at once that actually all these batches of episodes are going to be in April. So I'm going to have to do all of them at once, which none of you have ever had to do. So I don't think it's very fair, personally. But That being said? Yeah. That being said, I do have one. Uh huh. Yes. Um, I didn't invent it again. <laughs> just a caveat. I do feel like I need to I need to state that now. Um, it's another basing one. I feel like a lot of our hobby hacks come from basing. It's fine. It's a lot of basing that I picked up from James a little while ago, and he hasn't mentioned it, and I've taken it on and used it a fair bit whenever I wanted to do something like this. So, um, if you want to do like mechanical kind of ad mech or potentially even like Necromunda spaceship style basing, a great bit of kind of basing material to add to it is uh, like a bag of rogue random watch parts or like the coils and like... Is that easy to come by? eBay, cheap, just bag per like as uh, per weight. Like I've, pro- I've got, I bought one bag of it like years ago and I've still really? got them. Yeah. I didn't know that that was a specific industry of product was reselling random it's literally just parts. per weight like I, I imagine it's almost entirely for like craft things and yeah, not yeah. for actual watch repair or unless yeah. so I can does. actually answer this okay go on so I used to work for a watch repair company um, and all the they used to basically do all of the watches oh, I see where this is various, going. various retailers on the high streets so you take your watch in and get it serviced or it stopped working the arm stopped going etc blah blah so i used to work for a watch repair and i actually it's something that i haven't really spoken about much is that i actually was an apprentice watch repairer a couple of years, like before before siege and when i before i was in recruitment um so um you you used to end up with bags and bags and bags and bags of just like broken dead parts, dead parts. um and obviously even right. Even the mo- whether it's like an, uh, an like a, a, a wind up or whether it's like an automatic or whether it's like a, 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 a you know whatever method of mechanism the watch has got, there's always lots of components, be they plastic, metal, or anything like that whatsoever. So we so it's not like new parts to fix it. It's the opposite. It's all it's the like old getting stuff. Rid of old getting rid of parts, the yeah. bag that you will get or like what you'll get off of eBay will literally be uh, just a myriad of like from tens and tens and tens of different watches that's exciting your your little ad mech chap could be stood atop a watch that was like used for someone had that on their wrist for like 15 years yeah yeah yeah. but it just looks cool it's easy easy quick way to like decorate a kind of spaceship type thing isn't it but i just remember that yeah that was something that you obviously i picked up a lot since working here and it was just one of those really quick like easy things where i was like okay i've not heard anyone else talk about that i've not uh, heard that before i like it it. and it stuck with me so nice passing that on did not invent it Um, (laughs) you didn't invent the watch (laughs) didn't invent the watch but (laughs) yes okay thank you everyone for listening to this week's episode of paint perspective if you could please support the show by leaving us a rating or review on itunes like in the video leave a comment down below for question of the week support the show any way you can we also have a patreon linked in the description below there is a podcast here just for you listeners where you can support the show that way and you'll get access to our Discord as well. Thank you, everyone. We will catch you next week. 